Hey, good evening, guys. Good evening. Good to have you here. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about scan tools and finally get our class officially kicked off and rolling. Um, thank you for the wave there. Yeah, it's it's good to be it's good to be going. I wanted to let everybody have a chance to get kind of added into the class. The beginning of the school year is usually pretty hectic. I know a number of you guys are in other classes at the same time. So I kind of wanted to let the dust settle before we jumped into our scan tool stuff. Um, the way this class scheduled out being a full semester class, it gives us plenty of time to cover what, what uh, I want to cover. Now, this is only a one unit class. I really have like three units of information or more to give you guys. But my goal with it is that by the end, you'll be... Um, I have a good solid understanding of OBD2 and could and will be um, uh, will be well on your way to um, you know doing some good diagnostics. So whatever time you could spend with us is great. What I'm going to do is re record this session. I have a recording of the cloud. I'll I'll post it later for the students that weren't here to attend tonight. Um, I'll do a quick. Um, screen capture here and the reason i'm doing that is just to like kind of like a, a tennis chart just in case can uh canvas doesn't do it for me um which sometimes it does it and other times it doesn't so uh, we'll get that going and now i'm going to um now i'm going to share a screen yeah uh totally got it you guys if you're in night classes you'll have night classes starting up and so um uh, like I said, anytime you can be here with us, that would be great. All right, so let's jump in. So I put this together now. Gosh, yeah, I, I don't know. Every year goes by, I'm feeling older and older, guys. Uh, I remember as a technician, uh, you know, really get getting involved with cars in the in the '90s. Um, uh, well, really in the '80s, and then becoming a technician in the '90s, I saw this transition from you know, cars with carburetors to fuel injection. And when OBD2 launched in 1996, wow, that was that was a big deal to me. Um, so get my annotation tools going here. All right. So what happened is in the 80s, right? Um, several states like California, we had our smog check program and we also did some beta testing. And so we did what we called loaded mode testing. That's where the vehicle is on a dyno, right? And it's, we're measuring the emissions coming off of the rollers. And in fact, I had uh, colleagues that worked for AAA at the time, and they used an old Clayton dyno for their loaded mode testing. And through these, these tests that happened in the 80s and 90s, they realized, guess what? A lot of these fuel injected cars, yeah, they run better than carbureted cars did, but with their computer controls, I could have degraded systems and no codes, meaning that I could have a component like an oxygen sensor that uh, was failing. It was slow, it was lazy, it wasn't working correctly, but it wasn't 100% bad and that wouldn't necessarily set a code. So, oxygen sensors could get lazy, catalytic converters could fail. And your catalytic converters job is to burn up any emissions, the engine doesn't burn up. So a lazy cat, you're gonna have more, a lazy O2 and a defective cat, you're gonna have more emissions coming up the tailpipe. Um, we also had cars that were failing for oxides of nitrogen. That's what this stands for. The X is just like an algebra where there's a variable so it's NO1, if you will, NO2, and maybe that nitrogen can bond with three oxygens, right? You could have an NO3. So because this number could change, we call it NOx for oxides of nitrogen, which a lot of times is caused by having poor EGR. Basically, it, the exhaust gas recirculation valve wasn't working correctly. And basically, all these things would cause the vehicle's emissions to go up and not necessarily set codes 
or a check engine light. So as they were trying to figure out the standards for OBD2, they looked at these issues with OBD1 and started working on these standards. And really, this was all kind of planned out way back when, way back in 1988, which is probably going to be older than some of the students in this class. So I get it. This is pretty old. In fact, I was thinking back, you know, when I got started working on cars and, and I was a, uh, a high school student, you know, I was working on a car that was 30 years old. Uh, well, you know, that was a 1963 car. Now a 30 year old car is a 19, you know, 91 car. It's just like so much is different now. OBD2 is now 25 years old. But guess what? Even though it's 25 years old, there's a lot of technicians out there that really don't understand how it works and what's different about it. And they misdiagnose stuff because they don't understand the architecture. And so that's why we're looking at some of the history of this because it will lay the foundation as to why the computer is going to do what it does. Okay. So hang with me. I'm going to clear uh, those scribbles out. We'll get uh, someone else admitted into the, into our discussion, which is great. Welcome. And uh, let me keep going to our next slide. So we identified all kinds of issues through loaded mode testing. Now, just for you guys who may not be aware, when cars are built and they're coming off of the um, assembly line, they get uh, ran through a federal uh, test procedure. So um, what that means is they're going to pull a certain percentage of cars right off the assembly line, maybe 2%, 5%. If they're getting in trouble or cars are failing the federal test procedure, they're going to have to pull more cars out and test them. And they got to report these test results to the EPA. So it's kind of like a self-reporting thing that the car manufacturers have to do. But basically, this federal test procedure tests the emissions for the entire cycle. So they put the car in a sealed room, like we've drawn right here, and they measure all the vapors that evaporate out of the gas tank. Okay, They measure the vapors that are made when you're filling the car up with gas. They measure what's coming out of the tailpipe on a test drive through an emissions analyzer. Like the whole thing is monitored and those results get reported back to the, the government. And that, we call that the FTP or federal test procedure, okay? And so this is the vehicle meeting its regulations when it's brand new. The idea behind OBD2 was that for the life of the car now, we're going to try to get that car to maintain its compliance with the federal test procedure. But we're not gonna be driving around with an emissions analyzer always hooked up to the car. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a little bit more sophisticated software in the computer to indirectly monitor what its emissions are. So if it had any of these failures that we were looking at before, so let's go back a slide. So let's go back a slide, like degraded systems without codes, the EVAP system not working correctly, air injection that wasn't working, that's what those, those two smog devices are, a catalytic converter that's deteriorated, problems with the EGR valve, or anything that was going to cause the emissions to go up beyond the federal test procedure. And what we would usually say, hey, any failure that's going to be 1.5 times the FTP would cause the emissions to raise 1.5 time, times the FTP, that's going to turn on a check engine light to let the owner of the vehicle know, hey, something's wrong. So that's the goal of this thing. It's to monitor the life, the, the emissions over the life of the vehicle. 
things that are going to cause an emissions increase are supposed to turn on the check engine light. All right. So moving right along, let's look at the history of this stuff. So we started off in the early 80s and we had our first computers. Uh, we would be setting codes. Now, what we call codes today, which we didn't call, we just called them codes back then, but DTCs, data trouble codes. Um, some cars would have a check engine light. Some cars had some partial control over their various emission control devices and and you could, do, you could do scanner stuff. Throughout the 80s, we basically phased out carburetors and phased in fuel injection, and the controls got better. We also, in California, this is the Bureau of Automotive Repair, or BAR, we started what we call two-speed idle smog testing. And we still do that today in more rural areas. So if you live up in the sticks, you might need a smog every couple of years but you're only going to get your emissions tested at idle and at 2,500 RPM. Um, now, this thing's actually evolved to the point where on our new cars, on cars 2000 and newer, heck, we don't even measure the emissions. We don't even to do TSI and we totally rely, totally rely on the OBD system. But anyways, we started two-speed idle smog testing in the 1980s. And uh, when I started smogging, my machine, which was the new machine at the time, was the infamous Bar 90. And you get it, that's right, that machine was launched in 1990 um, and it automatically reported to the state's computer, which was a big deal. Before that, you basically measure the emissions and on the old machines, you wrote down what the readings are. So guys, you, you guys can make a smog certificate and you, they wouldn't even see the car. They'd be cheating smogs. They'd be like, what kind of car is it? Okay, I'll say it was real good. You know, They could basically phony up the smog check certificate. With the bar 90, now the smog certificate was electronically transmitted to a computer system in the state we called the BID or Vehicle Information Database. And when I started as, a, a, um, as an automotive technician, my goal is, man, I wanted to be a smog tech. I wanted to be running that bar 90 machine. I thought that was awesome. And then that machine evolved to the bar 97, where now we were doing loaded mode testing ourselves on the dyno. And I was just all about that at the time, running cars on the dyno and testing them. And so 1988, California requires that cars built for sale in California, meaning California emissions, have to have some type of check engine light on them. California Air Resources Board, that's what that means, guys. Um, the PCM was looking for new normality and fuel control. What, what does that mean? Well, basically normality, are the sensors reading normal? Is something opened or shorted? If it's not open or shorted, it was considered normal and it did not turn on a check engine light. Um, if the fuel control wasn't crazy out of whack, if it wasn't setting like an O2 rich code or, you know, it, no check engine line on, and you had to set some type of diagnostic trouble code. Um, also in 1988, again, that's when the feds set the standards for OBD2. And then moving on to 96, that's when OBD2 was launched across the nation. Okay, so it's been around a long time. We are now on our 25th year of OBD2, and it has continued to evolve over that time. Initially, I thought early on, because I've been working on cars and teaching people about OBD2 and learning about it myself for, you know, tw 25 plus years now, I thought by now we would be on like OBD3 or something else, but we're still on OBD2, although it has continued to evolve as time has gone on. Some things, though, remain the same, and that does impact our diagnosis. So, um, again, the regulations for OBD2, those guys were built on the OBD1 problem areas. And the idea is that we were going to verify that the components on the car were operating properly by monitoring them 
and their operation with the idea that I'm not directly measuring the emissions, but if I'm testing all the components on the car and all those smog control devices on the car, they're working correctly, well, the car should have low emissions is the idea. 1994, 95 vehicles, a lot of those were kind of phasing cars and they might have a partial OBD2 system that might have some of these functions in it. Some cars in early as 94 would have an OBD2 connector, but not a full functioning OBD2 system, or they would have some OBD2 functions with still an OBD1 old school connector. So you'll see that on cars if you happen to come across 94s and 95s, and I know they're getting rarer and rarer, but um, you'll see that on some of the cars out there. So let's clear out those drawings. So again, who set these regulations? Well, there was a collaboration between the, um, the folks at the Bureau of Automotive Repair uh, with California, so California Air Resources Board, the EPA, and it's kind of like these two guys really kind of set standards. The SAE, these guys had to figure out, well, how do we do this? How do we make the cars do what these government guys want them to do, okay? So the engineers figured out how to implement, how to make the cars do what they needed to do. The other guys set the standards. And remember, the goal is to monitor the emissions over the life of the car. So what did we get out of this? Well, we got expanded mill operation. Just that name mill, we no longer call it a check engine light. We came up with this generic term or I should really say the engineers came up with this term called the mill for malfunction indicator lamp that represents what used to be called the check engine light or the service engine soon light. We expanded the operation of that mill, making it a little bit harder to turn it on and definitely a lot harder for get it to automatically turn off. We came up with these, again, common names for components, standardized codes that was a huge deal to us to me probably the biggest thing was a common diagnostic connector saved me so much headache and frustration i, I can't begin to tell you um but there were some challenges i needed new emissions monitoring and stuff that i didn't have to deal with before and it required most all the manufacturers to to make a new scan tool to work on their cars and develop procedures using that scan tool so no longer could I test codes the old way. You'll see what I mean in just a, just a minute here. So all of a sudden I had different data selection screens. I mean, it was just on some cars, it was worlds better than what we had before. Now, going back to the common terminology, remember SAE, these guys came up with these terms. Um, before you had all kinds of different names for the same part. A coolant temperature sensor on GM would be called a uh, CTS. The new term now is ECT, and everybody had different names for the same thing. Computers had different names. So what OBD2 did is it helped bring us into common terminology, which that in itself made the thing made the cars a little easier to work on. So what's OBD? Oh, that's onboard diagnostics. The check engine light or service engine soon light, heck, now it's called the mill, malfunction indicator lamp. What about where I plug in my scanner? Oh, that's the data link connector. What do we call the computer? Well, now that's the powertrain control module because oftentimes the computer would control both the engine and the transmission. Oxygen sensors, ignition control modules, things like long-term and short-term fuel trim, and all of our scan data that we used to just call data, now we call those PIDs or parameter identification value or parameter IDs, as I like to think of that. So, I mean, this was a little different. If you were a, a dyed in the wool Ford guy or GM guy, like the, all of a sudden you had the terms changed on you and it was a little frustrating. But if you were like me, where I worked at an independent shop on all kinds of different brands of cars, it did make things easier to, to understand. The other big thing 
is now I had to pay to play in that I had to have a scan tool to access the codes and get this awesome data stream stuff that I was looking for. Look at what those PIDs are. Um, no more flash codes, so to speak. And, you know, by and large, that was good. Um, I remember trying to spend hours looking at flashing lights on Honda and Nissan ECUs and being like, well, was that, you know, was that five flashes or four? Am I in mode three or mode four on a Nissan? I mean, it was craziness. So I have to have a scan tool, but now I have so much more a information access at my fingertips than I had before. And really for a lot of manufacturers, I mean, it, again, it was just flashes and codes. That's all you had before they were forced to provide scanner access with OBD2. Now the manufacturers being who they are, they said, hey, you know what? We always want our dealership guys and gals to have a little bit better stuff. So most all the manufacturers pretty quickly figured out, okay, we're gonna make our own scan tool that provides you more information than the other aftermarket tools can, and it can do other things. And that's still where we are today, except those manufacturer specific scan tools by and large are computer or PC based and require you to pay money to a subscription to that manufacturer. But by and large, the dudes at the dealership, if you will, those, those folks will always um, have the most access to good service information and good scan tool diagnostics versus an aftermarket shop because of the way the manufacturer is working, right? So um, the SAE and EPA and all those folks, they, just, they decided to make some standard things that they wanted OBD2 to do. And at first we just started with, you know, four or five modes that expanded out to nine different modes. Now we have, I wanna say 12 different modes of operation that the OBD2 system is required to do. So this definitely has evolved over time. So if you look at this list, you can kind of see how it lines up. So mode one, and you go, well, what's with the dollar sign there? Does each mode cost me more money? No, when they set this up, they set up programming in what they call hexadecimal coding. So this hex system, this dollar sign 01, it was just a way to you know fit more data in the simplistic computers of the day. Um, mode one allowed you to look at your data, allowed you to look at what we now call the PIDs, okay? All that data stream. So what's the O2 sensor doing? What's the coolant temp? What's the mass airflow? That's what data stream gave you. And again, a lot of OBD1 cars did not give you data stream. Some manufacturers were great. In fact, GM was really good for self-diagnostics. I could pick up uh, a 1981 GM car and with a Tech 1 scanner or later on with like my Snap-on scanner, my red brick, I could scan that car and get codes. So here's my codes. I could get codes and data from a GM car in like 1981, 1982. Nobody else had that. Chrysler started with codes and data in 88. Ford kind of trickled in in the 90s. Most of the import manufacturers were garbage until they were forced to adapt this stuff in OBD2. So anyways, the older GMs, which it ended up kind of helping set the standard for what OBD2 was going to be, they could, they could give you codes and they could show you data. A lot of other manufacturers like Ford in the 80s, it was codes only. And they had their key on engine off codes, key on engine running codes. But with OBD2, they said, hey, we want, to get, we want you to have access to data. We want you to be able to read the codes and we want to be able to clear the codes. So if you look at this list here, Here's my data stream under codes. I could read them, I could clear them. And then they did some stuff that they had never done in the days of OBD1. 
they did this thing called freeze frame data, which was huge. And what freeze frame data was is, hey, how was the car being ran when the code set? So if the code was set when the engine was cold and you were accelerating up from, you know, from zero miles an hour to 45, it would set that that snapshot, it would set that freeze frame of this is how the car is being driven when it set that code. And that's such a powerful thing when you're trying to diagnose a car. So we now we have freeze frame data. We could tell what's going on with the O2 sensors. Later on, they gave us information about components that don't get tested all the time. We call those the non-continuous monitors. And as stuff evolved, we now had ability to control some of the systems on the car like the evap system and then later on we could actually request hey what's what's the vin number for this car what software is in the computer and that's pretty important if you're fighting a, a, a problem where maybe a car doesn't start or it's not running right and you find out oh somebody's reprogrammed this car or they got the wrong computer in that type of thing it's through this mode nine that if guys have reprogrammed their computer that the smog machine can figure that out now because it can access that information through OBD2 through mode nine. So you can see some of those different modes right here. All right, so we'll clear that out and keep going. So now we had a common connector for the scan tool. And to me, this was the biggest positive change with OBD2 is I now had this 16 pin connector right here that was the same size and shape for every car I was working on. Now there was still different communication protocols. Think of those as different computer languages that the cars could talk. They could speak J1850, ISO, 9141. Maybe I had high speed can or something like that. So they could speak different computer languages, but guess what? Now I only need one adapter. So one of the nice things about OB2 is this 16 pin adapter, man, it allowed me to hook up to, you know, every car on the block. So huge leap forward. Well, what did I have before this? Hey, I was all over the place. So here we're looking at several different connectors. This was the Chrysler connector that came about in the mid to late 80s. Here was the Ford connector and it was two parts. You had this part and then you had a little red wire coming to this piece that would want to break off. You had to plug both of those in your scan tool. Here's the GM one. And remember that the GM OBD1 was very, you know, set a lot of standards for OBD2. So you can see that looks very much like the OBD2 connector just as 12 pins instead of 16, and the sides are square instead of round. Here was your Toyota connector. So if you've ever set timing or something on a Toyota, you had a connector like that. Older Mazdas had a similar looking connector. I mean, basically you were all over the place. Now with these old connectors, one of the things that was kind of cool is that you didn't need a scan tool to pull codes, but oftentimes, Pulling those codes was a pain in the butt because you're watching flashing lights and you're having to count those flashes. And if, if you did it wrong, you're following the wrong code. But you could do what I called JTool diagnostics, meaning that here's that GM connector. I could throw my JTool in there. Whenever you use a paper clip on a car, it's no longer a paper clip, guys. Now it's a JTool. And I could throw that J tool in there and go from A to B on that old GM 12 pin connector. I could count the flashes of the check engine light. And if I had a flash, pause, flash, flash, pause, longer pause, flash, short pause, flash, flash. That was a code 12. And back in those days, if you had a GM with a code 12, it meant everything was A-OK. -okay. So a lot of these OBD1 cars, I could pull the flash codes with something as simple as a paperclip or a JTool, but that's all I was going to get with that device, okay? Now, I also have a picture here that hey, every manufacturer had a different connector, 
you were having a bad day when you're pulling out this guy. Now, this is my Snap-on Multi-1 connector. And what was it? It hooked up to your Snap-on scanner and you just had a whole bunch of different wires and you'd had to read the manual. And I said, okay, you're working on a, you're working on a, a, a Zuzu or something. Okay, we'll take the red and blue wire and the black wire, plug this into that pin and this pin. And hopefully you did all that stuff right. And if you did it right, maybe you got some flash codes out of it. I mean, it was just, it was a real pain in the neck and you were never quite sure what you were getting. European cars were even worse and they were all over the place. So to have that common 16 pin connector is just so nice to have. You really don't realize how nice it is unless you ever have to work on one of these old cars and it says to pull out the multi one connector. You know, it, that's the day you almost want to just like shut the hood of the car and, you know, tell your boss, hey, I'm not feeling good and go home because that's going to be a hard diagnostic day. Okay. Again, the terms for the parts were all different. So here's an example. Back in the day, General Motors called the computer the ECM engine control module. But Ford would call it the ECA for electronic control assembly. A lot of imports would call it the CPU or maybe the ECU for electronic control unit. And oftentimes you were trying to read different diagnostic procedures and you were asking yourself, WTF, how am I gonna figure out what's wrong with this car? If I worked at a dealer, I worked on the same type of car over and over, I could use my pattern failures to help me figure stuff out. But I'll tell you from experience at an independent shop where we would work on anything that somebody drug in there, it made it very, very difficult. So one thing that got maybe a little harder with OBD2 was how is the check engine light how is it going to respond? What's going to turn it off? What's going to turn it on? That did get more complicated. Back in the OBD1 days, what would happen is if you had a shorted sensor, boom, the light would turn on. If for whatever reason the sensor was no longer shorting, maybe it had some, some wires that were pinched and now they're not pinched, the light would turn out. So you ended up with some, what I'll call like, flashing check engine lights where they would come on, they would go off a little, little bit later, they come back on. And you know what happened as the customers, the v people that own the vehicles, they started to ignore this light. They're like, I don't know, the light says check engine. I pop my hood, the engine's still there, I guess it's fine. So with OBD2, they wanted to make sure that when that light turned on, it would turn on and it would stay on to hopefully get that person to bring their car in for service. And if a problem was really, really bad, really increasing the emissions, it would not only turn on, but it would flash the check engine light to say, hey, stupid, you need to bring your car in for service. You got some major problems. So the conditions to set the check engine light, to set codes, and then thereby turn on the check engine light, those do vary by what system is setting the code and what vehicle you're working on. The methods to turn off the check engine light vary between I got to turn it off with the scan tool to do, can I drive the car and have it test itself and turn it off automatically. So there's a lot of variables here. And of course, now there's some problems that I can have a problem in the car that doesn't increase emissions so it doesn't turn on the check engine light or it does not turn on the mill. And so what that means is, um, what that means is that this gets a little bit more murky. And so part of our class is to try to shed some light on this, on this uh, deal right here. So let's, let's dive into it a little bit more. We're gonna start with this coding system, this data trouble coder DTC numbering system. This was another thing that was standardized with OBD2. Before a code 45 on a Chevy would be something totally different on a Ford, would be something totally different on a Toyota. They all had different code numbers that meant different things. 
with OBD2, they said, hey, let's have an alphanumeric system. So the first, uh, first two digits would let us know what's going on with this thing. Okay, for instance, P here, that stood for powertrain, okay? The second digit told you, is it a generic code or a manufacturer specific code? So if it's a P0 code, I'm gonna put a G here, because that's for a generic code, meaning that a P0304, it's a generic code, that means the same thing on a Ford, as it does a Chevy, as it does a Toyota, as it does a Volvo, a P0304 is a P0304. Now, the next digit would tell me the system affected. So I got a P300 series code. So that tells me I have a problem in the ignition system or a misfire. In fact, a P0304 is a misfire on cylinder number four. So again, if I set a P0304 misfire on cylinder four on a Ford, that would mean the same thing if I saw a P0304 on a Chevy, it would mean misfire on cylinder number four. If I had a one here in this digit, if it was a P1 code, well now pump the brakes, that's a manufacturer specific code. So a P1304 would mean something different potentially than a P1304 on a Toyota, okay? So um, you can see now that we had, we had code sections for emissions, we have code sections for computer circuits, code circuits for transmission uh, controls, um, fuel injection, air metering. So we, we did a much better coding system than we had before. And by and large, when you set codes on a car, you might have some manufacturer specific codes, but you're almost always gonna also get some generic codes that you can access and help get you started on a diagnostic process. And that is so much nicer than what we had before with OBD1. So now this is where we start to really peel back the layers on what's going to turn on the check engine light. And by and large, those things are related to enable criteria being met and having something fail. Okay, so what is enable criteria? Well, enable criteria is a specific set of criteria or think of it as conditions necessary. Okay, so the car is gonna be driven in a certain way. It might be a certain amount of throttle. It might be a certain amount of temperature. Like maybe the enable criteria is I need the engine at least 160 degrees. That means this code won't set unless the engine is at least 160 degrees, okay? So the car will not test its various systems until you meet the enable criteria, okay? So what does that mean? That means that I could have a code, I could clear that code, and guess what? It won't instantly turn on the check engine light again, even if the problem is still in the car. Why? Because if I'm not operating the car in such a way that I meet these necessary conditions or the enable criteria, it will never test it, okay? Now, when you meet the criteria, then the computer, the PCM, powertrain control module, determines if the component or circuit is operating properly. It performs what we call as a trip. If it fails this trip, it will set a pending code. If it fails a couple of times, it'll end up setting a full-fledged code. And of course, that has to depend on if it's a type A or a type B code. And don't worry, we'll get into all that stuff. But this is the, the first step of the logic that you have to understand. The thing that kicked a lot of people's butts was they had a problem in the car. They cleared it. And they're like, hey, the check engine light's off. I must have fixed it. No, you didn't do anything. All you did was tell the computer, hey, clear the codes. So remember, it's not going to test components unless you have met the enable criteria. So that was a new hurdle that we had to deal with in OBD2 that we didn't have to deal with back in the days of OBD1. All right, so moving right along then. 
I mentioned that term a trip on the last slide. So again, what's a trip? Well, a trip is what we call this key on engine run, key off cycle, where you've driven the car in such a way that you have met some enabled criteria. And what that's done is it's allowed a given diagnostic test, what we call a monitor to run. Now that monitor could be for the catalytic converter. It could be a monitor uh, for the EGR valve, but you've let that monitor basically do its thing and test that system. Why? Because you met the enable criteria. So if you get in your car, you start it up, you start driving, and during the course of your drive, maybe you need enable criteria for three or four different monitors, the car tests those various systems and components, then you've done a trip, okay? All you need is one monitor to run and technically you've done a trip. However, the thing that I was really worried about when OBD2 came out was this next one, the dreaded drive cycle. What we were told early on is every car that we worked on before we gave it back to the customer, we were gonna have to do a drive cycle on this car to make sure everything was a okay. And that's not a bad idea, but it can take you, you know, hours to do a drive cycle. Sometimes it can only take you minutes, but some of these drive cycles are really a pain. Sometimes they require the car to sit overnight. What is a drive cycle? It's a key on engine run, key off cycle, which you drive the car a special way to meet all the enable criteria. And that allows all the monitors to be completed. So I got to run the vehicle through a particular sequence. We'll typically include a warm up cycle. It might include a, a cool off period where the car sits and cools down. It can be tricky to run a drive cycle. There's some cars that the only way I could get them to run a drive cycle is to put it on the dyno and drive the car a certain way. Because driving it around on the streets here of the greater Sacramento area with the way our traffic is, you can never drive the car how you needed to, to get the monitor to run. I remember trying to set an EGR monitor. And you had to, you know, get going at freeway speed and then do a D cell from like 60 down to 30 without touching the brake pedal. And, you know, that was just impossible to do. People would get in front of you. They would, they would put the brakes on. You'd have to put the brakes on so you didn't hit them. Um, so anyways, drive cycle, you're running all the monitors, a trip, you're just running maybe one monitor or more. So through that, what we realized was that, you know what, if I had a code, let's say I had a code for an oxygen sensor and I replaced the oxygen sensor, what I would want to do is, you know, just focus on what do I need to do to meet the enable criteria to get the car to test out that oxygen sensor. So I started paying attention to what's the enable criteria to get certain tests to run. So again, you turn the key on, you meet your enable criteria, the car tests out its stuff, it reports its test results to the computer, which you can access through your scanner, and you can then shut the car off and, and see what you've done, okay? If you don't meet the enable criteria, it will never test the component and you won't know. So for instance, I could have an O2 sensor code that requires the car to start up cold and watch the O2 sensor warm up. If I clear that code, and I keep restarting that car and the engine's hot and the O2 sensors are hot, you know, I could, I could run that thing all day long. It'll never do the test to, it'll never meet the enable criteria to run the O2 monitor to test itself out. And so I could think, oh, I, I must've fixed it. Or maybe it was a false code and I'll be like, oh, I'll just give it back to the customer. I guess, I guess it didn't matter, it's fine. And then of course I give it back to the customer. What happens a couple of days later? boom, the check engine light comes on because it took that long for it to meet the enable criteria, to run a trip, fail the monitor, 
and turn the light on. Okay, so that's kind of the logic of this thing. Now, again, drive cycle, you would be running all the monitors and it, like I said, it required you to drive the car a special way. So here's the old GM drive cycle. And it's kind of a good example of what a drive cycle was. For, so if we look at this example, we had to start off with the engine cold, at least below 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Then we start up the car, okay? And it runs uh, two and a half to three minutes. It's testing things out like the canister purge, it's looking for misfires, it's checking fuel trim. Before I do all this, I had to make sure that the tank wasn't empty, but also the gas tank wasn't full. So all of a sudden, like how much gas was in the car mattered. And what would happen to you all the time is you get somebody and they bring you the car, and especially if it was like a used car lot or something, that stupid thing would be out of gas. Well, it's never going to run the monitor because the fuel level is too low. Or you get the very conscientious customer. And what do they do? They fill up the car with gas right before they bring it in. Well, guess what? I can't run a bunch of monitors, especially for the EVAP, because the fuel level is now too high. So things like that didn't matter in OBD1. Now, all of a sudden, that mattered. So what would I accelerate up to 55 at half throttle? I cruise around at 55 for three minutes without doing like hard D cells or accelerations. How impossible is that to do on Highway 80 here? Pretty, pretty darn impossible, right? But when you're doing that cruising steady, the computer could then test its air injection, its EGR, look at fuel trim, test the oxygen sensors. Now I needed to let off the gas and let it slowly decelerate to 20 without hitting the brake, and then I would accelerate back up to 55. Again, next to impossible to do on our busy city streets, right? But when you did that, now it could test the EGR valve, it could test canister purge, again, look at fuel trim, cruising around here. Now I'm testing stuff like the catalytic converter um, to make sure it's working correctly another big D cell without brakes. And again, I come back and let it idle down and I'm gonna look at that catalyst again, 30 seconds in drive and then I shut the car off. I mean, this was difficult to do unless you had a dyno to run this car in this way. So that was the drive cycle. And this is why in 1995, us technicians, we were all pretty stressed out because we thought every car we worked on that we fixed some type of computer system problem on, we were going to have to do this drive. Well, you know, that would at least be a day, an extra day of repair time before we could give the car back to the customer. And the customers, generally speaking, they're not going to be too happy with, wait, you're charging me, you know, an extra 50 bucks, an extra hundred bucks just to go drive my car around. Like, what are you guys doing? Right. Nobody wanted to pay for that. So, it was a big deal for us to realize that, hey, I didn't have to do all this stuff necessarily to verify my repairs. I just had to do a trip and at least make sure the stuff that I worked on was testing out. Now that can still bite you in the butt and it's never a bad idea to do a drive cycle if you have the time available to do it. What I would encourage you guys to do in this class is to clear your codes, which will delete all your drive cycle monitor information, and then go try to do a drive cycle in your car driving around town to see if you can follow this sequence and get it to run all the monitors. And we'll talk more about that later in the class. But at least now you have an appreciation for what the drive cycle is and how you would, how you would perform one. There's something else I want to introduce you guys to. Some of you guys are in the multimeter class. And I think the multimeter class and the scanner class pair back and forth really nicely together. In fact, last semester, I taught them both myself. This semester, due to you know, my loading and wanting to bring some new instructors on board with us at ARC, I gave away my multimeter class uh, to, uh, to Lee. And I think he's doing a great job with that class. But if... Um, if you're doing this right, you would really 
do both classes. Why? Because the scan tool gives you what we call backdoor information. Oops, let me back this up, speaking of backdoor. In that you're looking at computer processed information on your scan tool, it's not live. The multimeter allows you to analyze the signals directly coming into the computer. So with the multimeter, you're testing the front door, the raw signals. From the scan tool, we're testing the calculated signals. And the way I look at this is the scanner is kind of like your directional compass. It gets you in the general ballpark. Oftentimes, though, I'm going to still need that multimeter to actually pinpoint the exact cause of the problem. So these two tools really do work together. All right, so in the class, you'll hear me talk all about front door, back door stuff as we kind of go along. Now, what's this slide about? This slide's maybe a little confusing. What I want you to realize is that a modern car is basically a rolling computer network, okay? So here's your modern vehicle network system. This particular car has basically one, two, three, four, five, five different computer networks that are all tied in together. So we, this car has what we call the controller area network or CAN bus here in black. It has its, um, instruments and different things those look like they're uh they're running here with the door locks and stuff maybe they're on our our lin bus we might have our gps bus for um uh the map system we're going to have a media bus that's going to control our stereo system and maybe some dvd players and stuff and basically all these things if i look at this Here's a mirror. Here's the driver's door switch. Okay. Here's the, the driver's seat, the passenger seat. Here's the heated window. All the, here's the tail lights. Here's your instrument panel, your sunroof, your radio. Those are all computers on the network. You might not think of your driver's window switch is being a computer on a network. But I'll tell you what, if it's something built in the 2000s, odds are it is. And what happens is that at some point, all these computers got to be able to talk to each other. Now, they might speak different languages. I'm going to have one computer system on the car that's going to be my universal translator, if you will, uh, that will be able to speak all the languages and basically link all these different computer networks together, okay? Um, so this is a modern vehicle system and as you, a network system, as you can see, that there can be a lot of stuff on there. When uh, Chevy launched the Camaro, relaunched it, so this is 10 years ago uh, or more now, when that new Camaro came out, uh, I got to scan one. And at the time, I remember being impressed that, wow, that C Camaro had 54 different computer modules on it, okay? But even before that, I was working on an early 2000s Corvette that wouldn't start because the security system couldn't talk to the key because the network was shorted to ground due to a shorted power window switch, okay? so. These net, this network and the computers being able to talk to each other is super, super important. If that doesn't happen, the car won't start. I'll give you one other example that I was fighting this summer. My wife's car is a 2007, so that's, you know, uh, over a 10-year-old um, car now, 2007, Sa 2007 Saturn View. And it's the hybrid model. And we did, uh, she got in a little wreck and we did some body work on the front end. And in the process of working on it, uh, some of the guys helping me uh, decided they were also going to clean up the interior. 
and they unplugged a computer module in the back of the car. So they unplugged the computer module back here as they were taking the seats in and out because they were going to help me shampoo the carpets. I mean, really nice, except they caused me so much work because I kept looking up here in the car because I was setting computer network codes thinking, well, this is where the body damage was. My problem's got to be over there because I'm not, I'm having different computers not talk on the network and the problem was back here. What would the car do? It would not want to start. You would turn the key, nothing. Nothing would happen. If you bypass the ignition switch and jump started it, if you will, it would start and run for a second and then it would shut off, which again shows you why almost every like crime movie or any, any movie where the person jumps in a car, randomly grabs some wires from underneath the dash and touches them together, the car starts up and runs. That is so complete fake phony stuff. Um, that doesn't, that's not how cars work. Unless you're ripping out the wires on a 1965 Chevy, you're not going to be able to start the car on anything, you know, 1990s and newer doing that because of the security systems we have built into the car and the way these networks work on the vehicles. So a modern vehicle network, hey, it's complicated. And furthermore, when you hook up your scanner, guess what? your scanner becomes one more little computer that you've tapped into that network. So let's see how that is gonna come about here. So here's our scanner communication. You, we hook up our scanner. Remember, we're getting what we're gonna call backdoor computer processed information. What's the scanner gonna talk to? He's gonna talk to the computer that I called the translator, that's technically called the gateway module. He's the one that can speak different communication protocols to these various networks on the vehicle so that when you ask for codes, he can check, okay, well, engine computer, do you have any codes? Transmission, do you have codes? Body, do you have codes? And he can basically pull all those different computers through the gateway module and then give you some information. So if this gate, if this network's down or the gateway module was down, you're not gonna have any communication, okay? So the gateway module, remember, that's like your universal translator, if you will. So again, if I hook up my scanner then, built into the, the software of the vehicle, there's also two sides of the vehicle. There's what we call the OBD2 generic side, which is this, which is your freeze frame, your monitors, your codes, your PIDs, everything we've been talking about. But a lot of times, like I told you before, the car manufacturers wanted to have their dealership techs have some special stuff, right? So oftentimes there's a separate side of the computer programmed, the side we call the manufacturer side. And there's manufacturer specific data that you can access on that side of the computer. If you have a manufacturer specific scan tool, like you have the factory General Motors uh, Tech 2, or now it's the GDS, or you have the, you know, the Ford ID, you know, you have the, the factory scan tool, or you have a really good aftermarket tool like the Snap-on Solus Ultra here that can emulate the factory tool. And we'll get more in that as we go through our class. So that's a little bit how the scanner hooks up. Remember, when you plug in the scanner, whether it's a Snap-on Solus or it's a ELM generic little interface like we're gonna use, your scanner has just become another computer on the network. So keep that in mind. All right, so let's say you go to hook up your scanner and you are having communication issues. You can't give it, get it to communicate. Well, you could have several different, several different problems here, guys. And I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually change my screen share slightly so that I can do something here, so that I can turn on 
my document camera. So hopefully now, let me make sure this is working. Yeah, you can see my screen and here's my document camera. Brighten it up a little bit with the light. And what you can see here is I have different scanner interfaces. Now let's see if I can focus those up for you guys and make those look a little bit clearer. For our class, what we're gonna want is a generic ELM style scanner interface, or actually you could use any scanner, but what I'm gonna build our class off of is this scanner right here. So let me get that fired up. This is an app that you can get for free from your, for your phone or mobile device. It could be an iPad, it could be an Android tablet. Here I have it on an Android based cell phone, but why I picked it is that this app works for both Android and Apple products and for iPhones. And it works pretty much the same for both products where a lot of stuff will be way different on the Android ver version than the, than the Apple uh, iPhone version. So it's free and it's available on both product lines. And guess what? It'll do the vast majority of your OBD2 generic tests. It also has a demo mode. So if, if you know, before, like you know, one of your questions is probably gonna be, well, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do before the next class session? At the very least, I want you to download this app called Car Scanner Pro. And that information and stuff is on Canvas. And then I want you to play around with it. So I can hit demo here. And what you'll see is it will simulate me being hooked to a car. So it says ELM connection. That means that it's communicating to my ELM device here. ECU connection connected. So if you have a connection issue, what you wanna do is look right here and ask yourself, was well, it the cell phone is not connecting to this little interface box? Look at the lights on the box, make sure that they're on and flashing. One of the pins, pin 16 on this box is supposed to be 12 volts power. If I don't get power to pin 16, this box won't light up and will never be able to connect from the cell phone to the ELM interface, okay? So I wanna check that line to see if he's connected. And then once it actually communicates to the computer, it will say ECU connection connected. So what that means is that this interface is speaking the right computer language, the right communication protocol to communicate with that vehicle. And my warning is this particular one I have right here, this is a generic Bluetooth style ELM327 connector. It says it supports all OBD2 protocols. Eh, no, it doesn't. This thing will not communicate to older J1850 protocol cars. And I have a video I took of that and I will, um, I'll get that thing linked up to YouTube and post it to our class. It's, um, it's uh, kind of frustrating. Now at the college, and I got to check because I tried to set these so that you guys could check them out. Now I can buy this tool for, you know, less than $30. It's somewhere between like 15 and 25 bucks. At the college, I bought a couple different tools. I have this little one called the VPeak. That works really good on the Android stuff. Does not work well on iPhones. But if you have an Android phone, this is a nice little interface. It's nice and compact. It seems to support all the communication protocols. It has little lights that show through the plastic there. Um, so you can see what's going on. It doesn't stick out very far. Like here's that 16 pin connector. I plug it in. One thing I like about it versus this one is this one a lot of times I'm, I'm communicating with the car then my knee hits this, it unplugs it and I lose my communication. So this one's kind of long and it's in the way. This one's nice and short. And again, that one works really well with your Android products, your Android stuff, okay? Um, so I have some of these V-peaks there. 
the other one I really like, and this is the one that works well with iPhones. It will also work with with uh, Androids though. Um, it's a little bit longer, so I like the. If I have an Android phone, I really like the V Peak better because of its its small profile. Um, plus, this one after a while starts looking dirty because it's white. But anyways, that's this Vicar one. This thing works great. It's supported every communication protocol I've tried. It communicates well, whether it's an iPhone, whether it's an Android phone. So definitely, if you have an iPhone, this is the one that you would either want to buy or check out. And uh, it, wor it, works, it works really well. Now, you might not see, hey, where's the lights on this? The white plastic is translucent enough that there are some LEDs on the bottom of this. So if I plug this thing in and it's getting power and a ground from the 16 pin OBD2 connector, you'll see a little red light shine through that white plastic. And I got to admit, it does have a pretty nifty little case that it fits in. So again, we have these two interfaces for you to check out at the ARC tool room. In theory, any ELM327 compatible device uh, should work for you though. Um, this is the one that I probably had the best luck with on both Apple and Android phones. And like I said, the app that I'm gonna use for a lot of our presentations and the basis for a lot of our stuff is gonna be this car scanner app, car scanner pro. And there's a, there's a free version and there's a paid version that costs like $5. Um, it basically does all those modes of OBD2. It'll pull codes. It'll look at your data. It'll allow you to record data. You can see in the center of the screen, like, you know, this is, um, simulated data, but you can see all the different PIDs on there, right? So I'm going to go back. You can pull freeze frame. Nope, there's no code, so I guess I'm not getting any freeze frame out of the demo. Um, I can record the data. It even has some stuff that's not really related to OBD2, like acceleration tests, uh, that aren't really related to what we're doing in class, but I've had several students tell me that that was kind of fun to test out. Um, Non-continuous monitors. I can even graph some of that data, and I can use this as a little bit of a, of a dash indicator. So you can set this thing up with your ELM device and use it to monitor things. So one of the things I like on my truck when I'm towing is I'll set this gauge right here to transmission fluid temperature and then i can see what's going on in my transmission if i'm towing a heavy load with my truck and trailer all right so car scanner pro that's the app we're going to use for class like i said you only need to use the free version um if you want to get the paid version it does it does a few extra things that work a little smoother it can graph more data that type of thing um but that's what we'll base our stuff off now if you have any other OBD2 scanner that can do the vast majority of those modes, a scanner that can get you things like data and codes and the freeze frame, and it can look at what your monitors are. You know, if you can do the first eight modes of OBD2, you'll be able to use it to do that class, okay? I'm gonna throw the demo back on, I'm gonna hit um, emissions test. Remember we were talking about monitor? Here's all these monitors, misfire, fuel trim, components, catalyst, heat catalyst, air injection, EGR. And we'll talk more about those as we go through the class. Um, but anyways, it, the demo mode kind of gives you some understanding of how, how the tool is gonna work. So at the very least in our class, Download this demo mode on your phone, play around with it. If you're at the college and you wanna check out one of these, there's a procedure to check that out. Or if you wanna pick up one yourself, I think they're good to have. Like I always keep one in my cars. So if I have driving down the road and the check engine light comes on, I wanna pull that code right now. I wanna see what's going on. 
because I want to know, well, you know what, is it something I have to worry about and deal with right now? Or is this something that, you know, it's not that big of a deal. It's an EVAP code. I'll keep driving it and I'll get to it, you know, when I have a chance, right? If it's a misfire problem or a fuel trim problem, I'm going to want to deal with that problem right away. If it's something else, I'm probably going to let it ride. So it's nice to have access to this so you know kind of the general direction of where you're going, okay? The other thing is I'm going to switch this back out of this document camera mode. And now I'm going to go back to our computer. And I'll change the screen share. Um, if you go to hook up your scanner and it doesn't communicate, my biggest tip here is, hey, try a different scan tool. Try a different scan tool. So you could have a $3,000 Snap-on Solus Ultra and it won't communicate. There might be just some glitch in that scan tool software. So you might be able to throw on your ELM 327 device and your cell phone and get that car to scan. And that's at least going to let you know, hey, the problem is not the car. The problem is my scan tool. And that happens more often than not, okay? If you try a different scan tool and it still doesn't communicate, now I'm checking for pin fitment, I'm looking for network problems, maybe I have a non-supported protocol, now I'm jumping into a full diagnostic. But if I hook up my scanner and it doesn't communicate, again, try a different scanner. So what I was having students do last semester during lockdown, because the college wasn't open, is they would try their little ELM 327 device, whether it was the Vicar one or the VPeak one. And if it didn't communicate, I'd say, hey, you know, go down to O'Reilly's or AutoZone or any of those auto parts stores will give you basically a free code scan and see if it talks to the, whatever scanner they have at that auto parts store. If it does, the problem's not your car. It's some type of communication protocol or pin fit issue. But if it, doesn't communicate to your scan tool, it doesn't communicate to their scan tool, yeah, I got a problem with the car. If it communicates with their scan tool, then it's a problem with your scan tool. And that's how we, we figured out, hey, I had this um, generic 327 ELM Bluetooth one that just did not support the old J1850 protocols. All right, so we need to wrap this up and guess what, we are getting towards the end. So what's our review here? Is that one of, one of the things I want you guys to get through your mind is that, hey, when the mill, right, the malfunction indicator lamp, when that mill is on, now the computer's your boss. Because when the mill's on, right, the customer's gonna bring you your car and they're gonna be like, I don't know what's wrong with it. Check engine lights on. I want you to figure out what it is. Your job at that point is to figure out what is upsetting the computer? What monitor is failing? Why is it failing that monitor? To turn off that check engine light, to turn off that mill, you're gonna have to make that computer happy and keep him happy to keep that mill off. That's why I say at that point, hey, you're a slave to the computer. The PCM's your boss. Your goal is to figure out how does it work? What's the enable criteria, okay? And that's why to understand that enable criteria is even a thing is really, really important. I know so many techs who misdiagnose stuff and they miss it and they think they fixed the car and they haven't fixed it because they don't understand what enable criteria trips and drive cycles are all about. They throw parts at the car. The light doesn't come back on right away. They think they fixed it. They give it back to the customer only to, to lo and behold, realize that, you know what? The problem's still there. And now the customer has completely lost faith in my abilities to fix this car. We also talked tonight about, hey, the goal of OBD2 was monitor the, the emissions over the life of the vehicle. And it was built off the shortcomings of OBD1 that we found through emissions testing way back in the 1980s. Lastly, we talked about, hey, if you are trying to scan your car, you can't get it to communicate, first try a different scan tool. That's the first thing I want you to try.
All right, so with that, our conclusions is, hey, OBD2 is an evolution of OBD1 and it's continued to evolve over the last 20 years with additional test modes that we'll talk more about as we go through the class. OBD2 diagnosis is gonna require you to use the scan tool. You gotta pay to play, right? Now what's sweet is I only gotta pay 25 bucks and a free cell phone app to start playing around with OBD2. No longer am I gonna be able to use my J tools to pull codes anymore, right? Having access to multiple tools is always good. So even if you buy one of these little VP scanner interfaces today and you think, oh, I won't use that later. You know what? You never know. You could have a $5,000 scan tool that for whatever reason, the software in that scan tool has a glitch and it won't scan that 2004 Prius you're trying to look at. This becomes your backup tool to make sure that that car can communicate. So I still think that these will have values for you later, even when you have yourself a more expensive tool. Okay. With that, that's our wrap up for tonight. Hopefully you guys got something out of that. Again, I'm going to uh, save this recording. I will post it to share with our other classmates. Um, I should take one more uh, screen shot here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my uh, screen share right now. And I'm going to do another do another little screenshot right there so I can kind of sit, make sure I, I got my role saved so I can give you guys um, credit for, uh, for being here. Thank you for hanging out tonight. And, um, you know, any questions as we go to wrap up? Get that, some of that stuff out of the way. Well, um, again, let, let me switch this back to our Canvas class, and I'll change my screen share. There it is. All right, and I'm sorry, we went a little bit. We went, a, no. We went a little bit long. Uh, when you're in Canvas, always look at the announcements coming up on the screen right here, because those announcements uh, will help you stay connected with the class and what's going on. I'll start going through your activities here this weekend and check out your discussion and participate with you guys in that. Your goals are to get yourself a scan tool or at least one of these little scan tool interfaces, get that app on your cell phone and try to start scanning some cars. Because what I'm gonna ask you to do pretty soon is to, um, what I'm gonna ask you to do pretty soon is to scan your cars and identify some problems so that we can use those as case studies to figure out in our class. So we will spend time basically in class uh, virtually working with you on your cars. Okay, so um, if you look at Canvas here and you look right here, there's this to-do thing, that will let you know what do you have to do next so I'm in my student mode right now. I haven't really done anything in student mode. So that you can see all the stuff I have to do. Our first kind of like big assignment here coming up will be to get yourself that scan tool. Again, you can get it from the college. You can use any OBD2 scanner you want as long as it does the vast majority of the OBD2 testing modes, okay? And then you'll have some other stuff to do like the online safety test and some other things. But the big thing is get your scanner interface, get that app on your phone, start scanning some cars and start identifying some problems because we'll be talking about your cars as we come up on future classes. Um, we will probably have a total of about uh, somewhere between six to maybe eight class sessions over the course of this semester on Zoom uh, as we go through various presentations that go into different facets of onboard diagnostics okay so so stay tuned for that um we'll keep picking on wednesday nights for the vast majority of those 
um, we may not meet every Wednesday. We'll probably go like every other week. Okay. So and I'll put that under the announcements link. Okay. So again, check the to do tab. So you know what's coming up next. Always look at your announcements to stay plugged in with what we're doing. Email me if you have any questions or anything. And again, I appreciate you guys uh, hanging out with us. Okay. So with that, that's all I had, and I'll let you guys go. Again, I apologize for taking a little bit longer time. The, the first class session takes a little bit longer to get us going. So anyways, thank you so much. Good night, guys.